I remember for, for the longest time I've always been wondering what is really at the base of effortless performance? When does it start? How does it start? What are the key ingredients to really bring performance? You see it in sportsmen, you see it in politics sometimes, you see it in uh, business. Some people have really a knack to really make it look really effortless. And that's something I've been wondering for a long, long time. And I've been exploring and trying to understand where does it start, how does it start. And in my case, that's something which started when I was 12 years old. It started at 12 years old when I, I asked my parents to send me back to a boarding school. I told them at 12 years old, the thing you're going to do now is to send me to this boarding school. Actually, to send me back because I was there six months earlier. And, and at that time, I was crying for them to take me back home. But six months later, after a few incidents here and there, I believed for whatever reason. I believe that the only thing that was great for me, that would make them happy, that would make me successful in whatever way that could define it at the time, was to go back to this very stern, violent, physically, and emotionally, and psychologically environment, a place where competition was the only name of the game, a place where you didn't have a choice, you couldn't really be a child, as we would see in a, no, uh, today's term, I mean, all, all things equal, we were living in France, it was kind of okay. But for me at the time, that was the only thing I really wanted to do. So I went there for four years. I did another four years. So eight years in boys only school. So some, some place it has to explode, it did. But if you fast forward 17 years, and 17 years later, I'm 29, and I'm standing on the, on the balcony in my parents' apartment in Paris. And here I am ready to give a phone call to as someone in China. At that time, I'm successfully running an organization in distribution in Europe. We, have, we are a small organization. It's about 100, 150 million euro. It's really successful. We are proud. We are 29. We started at 25. And the world is in front of us. But that's not enough for me, because for me, I need more. And I'm ready to take the call from Simon. Simon was the English name of the person I was going to speak with to help him to move from Christmas light manufacturing to shipbuilding. For me, once in a lifetime opportunity, I'm here, I'm seeing how much goods want to come to Europe and I want to be part of it. So I'm ready to spend all my energy to convince Simon that the next thing to do is to have him with me and develop this organization. On the other side of the window, here, my parents are, are waiting, they're waiting anxiously. And I'm here only focusing on this conversation, this conversation which is supposed to determine the next step of my career. So, I end the conversation, I go beyond the window and I speak with my parents and they are anxious, they look serious, and they should. They should. Because <clears throat> they want to talk about the cancer treatment my mother is going through. They want to talk about how the chemotherapy is going and how her cancer is going to be treated. And I know about it. I know about it because I'm the one who took her to the doctor a few months earlier. When nobody believed she was sick, I believed she was. I took her to the doctor and I saw death in the eye of the doctor at the time. And here they were anxiously waiting what I was going to do about this situation and was she going to survive and what, how long did she have, what was the prognosis? But in my, heart, in my heart, in my head, nothing else mattered but focusing on that deal. I could not see that. And it happens to all of us. But at that time, that was what was happening to me. The only thing was, will I go to China? And will she leave? Because it's not the right time for her to die. I have done all these things to be successful, to perform, to take this company further. So I decided, I went to China. I went to China in February 2005. It's a place I knew quite well and I could start to speak the language and started in a Chinese New Year and four months later I, I'm ready to go to another trip to Paris. I call, um, I call my lawyer because I was going to sell an apartment to be even freer in China. And when, when I'm calling, I'm calling, um, I'm here on the, waiting for the lawyer to pick up and he picks up and he goes, oh no! Your mother was such a wonderful woman. And here in that moment, a truck 
at full speed is hitting me because I didn't know about it. I just knew that I was supposed to come back to Paris. And I'm holding the truck as he's raging full speed on the highway and me trying to hold, not knowing what's going on. I'm completely losing balance. And that's kind of balance I lost for a few months, a few years, trying to keep delivering. Because at the time, I still believed that I could deliver. I still believed that I could overcome death and the death of a mother or death of someone else. It happened to me in the past. But I was not yet able to see what was going on. So I tried. I tried. We, were, we became successful financially in, in the business. But the question I want to ask, and the question which is coming sometime at the bottom of effortless performance is, how connected are we with ourselves? And how disconnected are we from ourselves when we do what we do? How much do how much do we know what's going on in our heart, in our families? How much do we have to dig to keep delivering on the promises of whatever the convention is at the time? The con today, the convention is to deliver um, purpose and mission. Those are the big words these days. You, you get to have a purpose and a mission. But how connected are we, are you, are, to, to ourselves when we engage all our energy? I often say that it's a curse to be a smart person. Because when you're smart, when you have the capacity to manage information a bit faster, just a bit faster, it's just marginally faster than some other people, you also have more capacity to stay disconnected for just a little bit longer, just because I can. So long story short, I, um, I went through many rabbit holes. And at some point, I decided to do the things I could do in my sleep which was basically to be in conversation with people and, and help them to articulate what mattered to them the most, whether it was creating the organization or creating their life. And that's how I, I ventured into the world of executive coaching. And after working with hundreds and hundreds of people and thousands of hours of, of, uh, of coaching and facilitation and team coaching, there are a few things which emerged in what matters to bring a faultless performance. Because many of you here are examples of performance. Many of your friends, colleagues are also bringing performance. But how many of you are doing it without much effort? And one of the things I realize matters most, one of the two, there are two things which matter really a lot, I believe, is one is, of course, as I mentioned earlier, connection to self, finding what we are truly about beyond the, um, beyond the obvious beyond the typical answer we give to our friends and family, the things that really we care about, the things that get our guts and heart fully alive. How, how are we answering the question when nobody is around? What is it that I'm truly about? What are the things that keeps me awake at night? Because it matters. Because it matters for the life I have currently on this planet. Because that's the thing I really want to bring around me. That's the first question I ask everyone coming into my um, conversation or coaching suite. And quite often, that's a question which is a bit challenging, believe it or not. So what is it that really matters to us? What is it that really matters? What is it that you're truly about? I, uh, I have a couple of examples I want to share here. One is I've been fortunate to work with, uh, with the UNICEF for, for a little while. And I, 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 like to, I love to work in, uh, I'm normally invited to work with people who are going through a dramatic increase of fast transition, so dramatic increase of speed and complexity, whether that's in the case of UNICEF because of the obvious pressure there is when you work in Yemen or North Korea or places like that, or when you grow a tech company or when you go to IPO and suddenly there is such an increase in everything that you need to deal with that you have to increase your level of complexity. And in the case of Omar, it was quite, uh, it was just, I learned so much, it was an amazing opportunity to work with that man who only job is to bring water in places where there should not be any. And on top of that, there is a conflict. So in the case of Omar, in our conversation, I understood that his job was to bring water to children and their family in Yemen. And as, as we all know, Yemen is one of the most inhospitable places to be at the moment. And it was 12 months ago when we started to engage together. And what, what struck me about Omar is his immense clarity and how connected he was to everything he was doing. In Omar's world, his world where every life matters, Lord. 
It doesn't matter if you are against me, with me, if you are against each other. What is it that we can do to bring this pipe across the desert, across the mountain, under the bomb to make sure that the people, the children, have access to drinkable water so that they can stay alive one more day? And in many occurrences, he went against all, all the rules in the book just to make sure that people would have access to water. And he did that by bringing people from um, opposite faction to work together. Because what Omar understood is that people don't follow a leader, they follow themselves. People follow, don't follow a leader, they follow themselves. They try to, they follow what they, recognize, what they recognize in you. They follow themselves in yourself. Once you are so clear about what matters to you, people will follow you without any effort. And you, you as me, have experienced this in our life. It happened many times. But how much, how often does this happen? And how more could it happen if we are allowing ourselves to be connected deeply a little bit more of the time? There is, of course, the other examples in, in, in the business world, which I'm sure many of you are aware, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on this today, because I, what I want to focus on is, once we have identified what we really want to stay connected with, is how do we sustainably create an ecosystem and an environment to um, walk on that path or walk on that journey? And here comes the notion of the inner dialogue. Most of you, or many of you, might have heard of this, the inner game, the inner dialogue. And it, it's great to have a purpose, it's great to have an intention, it's great to have a passion, it's great to be really willing to go and to climb my Everest, to, so, to save the children, to raise a family, whatever that is. But how can I do this sustainably, and how can I allow myself to be flexible enough to adjust that purpose, to stay alive as well, and to stay fully um, able during that time. And what I understood, and what I've I understood because the quality of my inner dialogue was quite poor for most of my first, li first part of life, as it is for many people. And it's how do we develop, how can we develop awareness around what's happening in our head about all the voices that each one of us have, like right now many of you have some conflicting voices going in our head about how interesting this is or not, or how um, how new is information against what I've already read somewhere. And all these competing voices are creating a an echo chamber which sometimes keeps us busy as we're doing what we're doing. And the more we can gain clarity and awareness about what's truly happening within through practices of, um, of course, yoga, meditation, um, development of mindfulness and running, Every, anything you can do, reflective journaling, any practice you can do to create stillness, quietness, a moment of where you can start to fully listen yourself. Because only when we can start to listen your, ourselves without too much judgment, we can start to listen to others. And when we listen to others, we can start to lead. That makes kind of a bit of sense. But it's it's a, it's, a, it's a law, it's a rule, it's a process which sometimes takes quite a bit of time to learn because we are so, um, the word is in English, is infatuated, right? In, in love with ourselves or the image we have of, of ourselves on how it should, what it should like, look like, that it takes a bit of time to slow things down, sometimes an accident, sometimes a beautiful story, so that we can just make things quiet just for a little while. We can start to hear whatever happens inside, what are the key elements that we want to pay attention to, as you would do in your strategy meeting or board meetings, to start to deeply listen to what people have to say so that we can really talk to what is really driving them and where they want to go. And those are, those are the elements which then allow us to bring much more courage and elevate tremendously the quality of conversation and elevate tremendously our capacity to be courageous and uh, be a force of good, if you will, in the environment we are in. This is not something which comes, in my experience, it's not something that is understood very early on in life. It's ex actually, it's wrong. It's very easy to understand all of this. 
It's extremely easy to understand. What is not easy to do is to practice all these things. And that's really the key and the main, in, the main intention of this message here is what are the practice we put in place? What are the discipline we allow ourselves to follow so that we can start to perform from a place of effortlessness without any effort? That we can start to tackle issues which are much more significant to ourselves and to the people we care about, the communities, whether the close community or faraway communities, and have conversation at different levels of seniority which are really helping to move the needle. In this, in this environment, you are here clearly some of the gifted and uh, also blessed group of individuals who have access to so much wealth of experience, knowledge, and also pure, simple wealth, who can do so much. And the only wish I have when I'm, when I'm coming here in front of you is to, is to hear the answer to this question, how much good do you think that you can spark this weekend or later on, if you were able to connect from a place of deep authenticity with a lot of courage for every single interaction. What would happen if during our team meetings, during our strategic conversation, during when we're looking for a next place to explore and express our uh, talent, we were, we were doing it from a place of courage and authenticity? Because then comes integrity. Being in integrity with our capacity to manage complexity. And then on, the last invitation I have is, of course, to dream big because that's, that's just the beginning. Thank you very much.